Hey folks, I'm Chris Brenton and today I'd like to give you a demonstration of AI Hunter, our threat hunting tool that you can use to go through and do a compromise assessment on your network. So AI Hunter is made up of two components. We use bro slash Zeek to go through and act as a probe. So typically you'll install that on the internal interface of your firewall. And then it'll feed all of its data back to the AI Hunter system, which also provides the user interface that you're looking at here. We use a score-based system. So we go through and we hunt 24 hours worth of data 12 times a day. So every two hours, we're looking at the previous 24 hours worth of information to see if any threats are present. We go through and we assign a score based on what we're seeing. So if it looks like it's a beacon, if we're seeing unexpected protocols, some number of points will get assigned to that. You have full customization to change this around any way you want to. And then we'll go through and we'll assign a score to a system. Uh, hopefully your network doesn't look this bad. Uh, this is a lab environment with lots of C2 running. So the scores are a little bit higher, but you get the idea. So the concept is this tool is going off 12 times a day. It's hunting your network looking for bad guys. And we can actually go through and generate an alert for that. We can send it to a Slack channel. We can send it to any syslog compatible system like Splunk. And what did we allow you to do is to go in and set a threat threshold and identify any time a system exceeds that. So again, we're hunting 24 hours worth of data. So imagine you have a system that's in pristine shape. It has not been compromised. And then all of a sudden, oops, it gets whacked. Prior to being compromised, it's going to fall below this threshold. Once it's compromised, over time, you're going to see the score go up. So the more data we have showing the system is in a compromised state, the higher we're going to score that system. This is cool because if you think about how our security alerts usually work, they tend to fall into one or two categories. They either go off all the time, the exact same alert, which means we just learn to ignore it, or it goes off once, it's some convoluted alert that's hard to understand, and if you missed it, oh, well, you missed the fact that you got compromised. This is a series of increasing scores. So now I could have a junior analyst in a SOC, and I can easily train them to say, hey, if you see the score increase three or four times and it's going up 10, 20 cent plus each time, that's an issue. That's something we need to go in and investigate. And the next step from there would be to go into the user interface. So again, my left-hand side, this is my priority action item list. The top of the list is the system most likely to be compromised. Over on the right identifies all the things that we're seeing that it makes this thing you know, potentially suspect and worth investigating further. All these items are clickable. So if I want to say, hey, you know, you're certain it's a beacon, why are you certain it's a beacon? I can click on that. And here's my timeline graph along the bottom. So over my 24 hour period of time, my Y axis is quantity. So this IP address connected to that IP address about 2,800 times every hour over the course of 24 hours. Okay, that's a beacon. Uh, we do a time analysis. We also do a size analysis, which I'll show you in just a second. So, you know, is it a beacon, yes or no? This visualization makes it real easy to be able to go in and figure that out. Now, as I mentioned, we also go in and we do a size analysis. This is a unique identifier for us, meaning that I'm not aware of anybody else that uh, is, number one, hunting 24 hours worth of data each time. Uh, most use a two to three minute time period and that's it, which means if you get a slow beacon, they're going to miss it. But number two, we're also doing a session size analysis. So if you think about C2 and how it works, the majority of the time when this thing calls home, it says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And it's told, no, go back to sleep. That's the heartbeat. That's the signal that we're looking at right here. Anytime there's an outlier, anytime more data than that gets transferred or a different amount of data gets transferred like we have here, that means that's an indication that this thing called home and said, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And was told, yes, this is what I want you to do. Now, C2 channels tend to be encrypted or at the very least obfuscated, so it can be hard to see what commands went by. But we can see the 288 bytes were transferred. That's not enough to transfer my customer database. It is enough to maybe look at processes in memory, what files are in a directory, you know, and that's about it. So I know at this point, if I can get these bad actors off my network, my customer data is most likely still safe. We also give you a lot of information regarding this target IP to help with the investigation. So we're telling you it's in DigitalOcean here. Notice the fully qualified domain name. This is not a PTR record associated with DigitalOcean. Because Zeek is sitting just on the internal interface of the firewall, we see all the DNS queries that go out and we see the answers that come back. So it's even more data than you'd get out of a DNS log. With that information, anytime we go to identify a particular IP, we show what was the user trying to get to when they ended up at this IP address. 
this is cool because now if they're sitting behind a CDN network someplace, you know, Amazon, Akamai, whoever, you don't see they connected to Amazon multiple times. You see they connected to baddns.r-1x.com uh, or, you know, whatever the actual target domain is. That makes life a whole lot easier. Also, with a size analysis, this allows us to be able to tack uh, or identify uh, social media being used as a C2. If you think of email, right, on average, the average business person sends, receives about 130 emails a day. So if I was looking at a size display for regular email, I'm going to see about 130 different peaks that show up here. Uh, one of them is going to be a majority of the time when there was no mail, but then I'll have about 129 others that are, yeah, here's messages that went in and out. I'm going to be part of different, you know, like the everyone group within the company, there'll be times I receive mail. However, when you look at C2, C2 tends to look kind of like this. You see a peak, which is the checking for a command and there is none. And, you know, one or two outliers when that has actually been activated and that's it. So there's actually a different profile when you see email being used for C2 versus just regular email. And we can go in and we can tag that. Kind of useful. So again, we can identify things that are beacon based. We can also go in and look for extended, extended long connections that are taking place on the network. Um, along with identifying, you know, what the system is that you're talking to. We also go in and do an analysis on the communication channel. So Zeke will go through and Zeke will identify about 55 different applications. So for example, TCP 443 traffic will get identified as SSL because that's HTTPS. Could be SSL, could be TLS. They're both are going to get labeled as SSL because at least there's a handshake taking place. Notice these first three connections though. I got a dash. That tells me something's being tunneled through that port. There was no SSL header taking place. So how suspect should I be of this connection that's been held open for almost the full 24 hours out of the last 24 hours and it's not using SSL when it's communicating over TCP 443? Oh, I should need to be really suspicious about that. Now let's say I'm worried about this IP address and I think maybe I got something bad going on and I want to see, did anybody else communicate with it? In other words, let's say I did a forensic analysis and I identified, yes, this system is compromised. This appears to be its command and control server. My next question should be, is anybody else talking to that system? I can click on the IP address. I can jump into our deep dive tool and this will very quickly show me who is that system talking to. Okay, it was only this one system and that's it. Cool. So from the perspective of, do I have other potential compromised systems? No, I don't. I'm in good shape. I can also go the other way with that. I can look at an internal system and say, hey, if I think it's compromised, who is it talking to out on the internet? And now I have a summary of all the communications it did over the previous 24 hours. I can see all the additional in individual IP addresses, and I can zoom in on any of them to take a look at what did communications look like between this internal system and that external system. Makes life kind of easy. Uh, finally, we do a deep dive on DNS. So C, uh, DNS is the most popular command and control channel today. And it kind of makes sense if you stop and think about it. And it, when an attacker gets malware on your network, they need to find a path out. They need to find some way to get off your network. They don't know what your outbound firewall policy is. So they need to pick something that's going to be most likely in an open state. Well, DNS is always open. If I can talk to a local DNS server and I send DNS compliant requests to it, that'll get relayed out to the internet for me. So DNS is a real popular channel. We do a couple of different types of analysis. One is we look at the number of subdomains. We look at any, so we've seen, we've had customers tag uh, DNS over, excuse me, C2 over DNS that's been using MX records, C names, text records, Quad A queries, yes, there was a C2 channel embedded in 128 bits of the IPv6 address. Uh, we also saw DNS keys being used, which was kind of wild. So what came back was not a public key, it was actually the C2 channel. So to try to pattern match for like text records or something, you're gonna miss all those other variations. What they all have in common though, is they, in order to make sure they don't get stuck in local cache, is they generate a ton of different uh, subdomains. So some host name dot something dot something dot foobar.com or something along those lines. So we just go in and count those up. Normal is 10 or less. For big environments like Amazon, Google, Akamai, four or 500 is normal. Anytime you get over a thousand, yeah, that's C2 over DNS taking place. So notice this, we go through, sort it, and you can see it sticks out like a sore thumb. 
The other type of analysis we do is we look at how is the DNS information being used. Let me, let me show you a legitimate example first. So here's AkaDNS.net. It has 125 hosts that were resolved within it. My three internal DNS servers went and, taught and did these lookups. And then after that, 13 internal systems connected to each of those 125 hosts. Okay, that makes sense. That's kind of normal DNS communications. Now, if I go look at r-1x.com, it's very different. Only one system's doing queries. Only one system ever actually talks to the domain. Well, wait a minute. Why did I bother looking up 62,000 plus different host names if I'm never actually going to go to that domain? That, that's suspicious activity. So there's a lot of other tools here that we can go through and use. Uh, this is just a, the tip of the iceberg to kind of give you a, a feel for how this tool is and how it works. Um, if you want to learn more, please schedule a private uh, personalized Q&A session with us. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day.